Hi, Mary. I'm Mary Showman, and we are here to celebrate World Thyroid Day, May 25th. And it's a day that focuses attention on awareness of thyroid disease, diagnosis, symptoms, treatments, and other information of interest to thyroid patients around the world. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this live stream broadcast. It's the first time that we're doing this, and it's very exciting. It's uh, sponsored by My Med Lab which is a direct-to-consumer laboratory testing service that allows you to order your own lab work and maintain an online health record with your test results and then use your results to consult with experts or contact your doctors with that information for further follow-up and treatment. So it's a great service and I'm really thankful to them for sponsoring this uh, exciting informational event. Now on Livestream FAQ, we had uh, assembled the 20 top questions from thyroid patients that I typically get. In 15 years as a thyroid patient advocate, I've had thousands and thousands of emails and phone calls and Facebook wall requests and information requests. And so I am regularly getting those questions. So I wanted to go ahead and answer all of the top 20 questions. And that's what we're going to be doing today during this live broadcast. And I would encourage you to ask your own questions. If you didn't get your question answered in today's session, there's a spot on the homepage, thyroidhub.com, for you to include your own questions or search to see if your question has been answered uh, at another point. And we'll be scheduling more of these live stream broadcasts coming down the road, and we'll be able to get to your questions at that point. So I encourage you to ask uh, questions, send your information in, and we'll get to those questions over time as we do further uh, live stream broadcasts. So anyway, let's go ahead and get started today for World Thyroid Day. Uh, the first uh, question that I wanted to cover is what is the thyroid and what does it do? And this is, it seems like a basic question, but a lot of people really don't understand what the thyroid is. And the thyroid is a small gland. It's typically about an ounce, uh, very small in size, and it's located uh, behind and below the windpipe area in the neck. It's part of our endocrine system, and it's also our master gland of metabolism and energy. And the thyroid's most important purpose is to produce thyroid hormones, uh, triiodothyronine, which is the uh, abbreviated as T3, and thyroxine, which is abbreviated as T4. And what these hormones do is deliver oxygen and energy to every cell, tissue, and organ in your body. So that means that thyroid hormone controls all of the processes by which oxygen and calories are converted to the energy that your cells need in order to function. So thyroid hormones are really crucial to every facet of our physiology. And for example, your cells convert oxygen and calories into energy. Thyroid helps you properly process carbohydrates. Thyroid helps your muscles function properly. Uh, thyroid helps your immune system defend against bacteria, viruses, and toxins that we have in our food, water, and air. Your proper sexual development and functioning depends on the thyroid. Uh, your heart uh, pumping and your heart function is reliant on thyroid uh, function. You, your breathing is uh, uh, depending on the thyroid as well. Your nervous system function, uh, your intestinal system, your ability to digest and eliminate food is all uh, reliant on thyroid hormone. Uh, thyroid hormone helps strengthen hair, nails, and skin. It's essential for brain function and it helps your bones grow normally. So the thyroid, as you can see, is a very important organ. We can't live without the thyroid gland. We simply cannot live without it. So we have to either replace what the thyroid is producing uh, externally with medication, or we have to have a functioning thyroid on our own in order to survive. The second question that we typically get a lot is what is hypothyroidism? Because hypothyroidism is, at least in the United States, the most common thyroid condition. And frankly, it really is one of the most common issues around the world as well, uh, but for different reasons. There's different causes in different parts of the world. Uh, hypothyroidism uh, is also sometimes referred to as an underactive thyroid or a slow thyroid. And with hypothyroidism, it means we're not producing enough thyroid hormone. So this lack of thyroid hormone can develop for a variety of reasons. Your thyroid gland itself may not be producing enough hormone. 
the thyroid may have been treated with radioactive iodine or RAI uh, for thyroid cancer or for Graves disease or hyperthyroidism or for a very large goiter or nodules and that radioactive iodine slows the thyroid or makes it basically non-functional and inactive. It's a process called ablation, radioactive ablation. So your thyroid also may not produce enough hormones because it's being affected by certain medications. There are heart medications, uh, medications for bipolar disease like lithium, and a variety of other medications that can actually cause the thyroid to slow down or create hypothyroidism. Nutritional deficiencies in iodine can also contribute to hypothyroidism. Uh, you also may have a thyroid gland that is structurally damaged by nodules, infection, or atrophy. There are some cases where the thyroid has actually been surgically removed, so you're surgically uh, hypothyroid. When the thyroid is removed due to a large goiter or due to nodules or due to cancer, thyroid cancer, then you are permanently hypothyroid after that point and requiring treatment to replace the thyroid's missing hormones. Uh, the uh, small number of people actually have something called congenital hypothyroidism, which means that they're born without a functioning thyroid gland or their thyroid is small or they only have a fragment of a thyroid. So that is a particular condition. It's not that common, but it's, it's another reason that some people have hypothyroidism, lifelong hypothyroidism. Uh, and uh, thyroid hormone is essential to every aspect of our body's function, so a lack of that hormone, that condition known as hypothyroidism, is considered a significant health condition that warrants treatment. The next question that we have is, what are the symptoms of an underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism? And when you don't have enough thyroid hormone, um, everything tends to slow down and your symptoms tend to reflect that slowdown. So hypothyroidism symptoms can include a, a variety of issues. So for example, you may have difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering, or fuzzy thinking. You may be sensitive to cold or feel cold all the time or have very cold hands and feet. A lot of thyroid patients report wearing socks in bed even in the summer. You may feel uh, inappropriate weight gain or difficulty losing weight. This is one of the most common complaints that we hear from thyroid patients. You might have dry, tangled, or coarse hair uh, and hair loss. Uh, and, and in many cases, there's a very unique sign of hypothyroidism, which is loss of the outer edge of the eyebrow hair. So if you are losing hair from this area outward, or if you're having to pencil that in when you're doing your makeup for women, that may be a sign of hypothyroidism. Brittle fingernails or fingernails that are cracking and breaking all the time can be a symptom of hypothyroidism. Uh, muscle and joint pains and aches are a common symptom. Tendinitis in the arms and legs, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, and uh, uh, tendinitis that you get in the uh, shins as well can also be a sign of hypothyroidism. Swelling or puffiness in the eyes, face, arms, or legs are also common signs of hypothyroidism. Uh, some people have plantar fasciitis, which is a pain in the sole of your feet that's typically worse in the morning when you first wake up. The foot may feel very tight and very painful. Uh, some people have heart palpitations or an unusually slow pulse or blood pressure. So if you have a pulse rate of 50 and you're not a marathon runner, that may be a sign that you have uh, hypothyroidism. Low sex drive is a common symptom complaint in both women and men. Uh, infertility and recurrent miscarriages are also reported as side effects and symptoms of hypothyroidism. Some women have heavier, longer, uh, or more painful menstrual periods. So we see menstrual irregularities showing up as a sign of hypothyroidism. Some people have very high cholesterol levels, even when, on, uh, when they're taking anti-cholesterol medicines or statin drugs, or they're, ta they're on a low cholesterol diet, they may find it completely non-responsive to those measures. That can sometimes be a sign of hypothyroidism. Chronic or frequent infections, including yeast infections, oral fungus, thrush, sinus infections, these can be more common in people with hypothyroidism. Worsening allergies, itching, prickly hot rashes, hives, a condition called urticaria. These can also be signs of hypothyroidism. Shortness of breath or difficulty drawing a full breath. Some people call this air hunger. This can be sometimes a sign of hypothyroidism. Uh, constipation, the symptom that no one wants to talk about, very common in hypothyroid patients. 
uh, a full or sensitive feeling in the neck. So if your neck is very sensitive, if it feels full, if you can't tolerate ties, scarves, turtlenecks, that may be a sign of hypothyroidism. A raspy, hoarse voice. Uh, if your voice gets very different or you start to notice that you just seem to feel like you can't clear your throat, that might be a sign. And finally, slowed reflexes, typically uh, done by a reflex test with the doctor where they tap your knee. That can tell you sometimes they'll tap your ankle area. That can sometimes uh, show or uh, depict some slowed reflexes that may be symbolic of some level of hypothyroidism. So that's really the, the key symptom list. There are certainly many more symptoms, but that, those are really the key ones that I think most people are interested in, in knowing about. Now let's talk about the opposite problem, hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism refers to an excess of thyroid hormone. So you have too much thyroid hormone. It's also known as an overactive thyroid hormone or overactive thyroid. Um, hyperthyroidism can be caused by a number of thyroid problems, including autoimmune thyroid disease, such as Graves disease. Uh, in some cases, Hashimoto's disease uh, can also cause periods of hyperthyroid uh, in, in patients. Uh, hyperthyroidism can also be due to overexposure to iodine in some cases, even iodine contrast medium that are used for uh, medical tests. Uh, nodules in the thyroid can become active and independently produce thyroid hormone, and that may cause hyperthyroidism. Some people overdose on thyroid hormone replacement drugs, so if they're taking too much thyroid medication, that can cause hyperthyroidism. Uh, there are certain kinds of infections that can cause hyperthyroidism, and there are certain drugs that also uh, contribute to hyperthyroidism. In some cases, temporary forms of hyperthyroidism also develop after pregnancy. So what are the symptoms of an overactive thyroid or hyperthyroidism? When you have excess thyroid hormone, you have too much hyperthyroidism, thyroid hormone, your hyperthyroid, everything tends to speed up. So again, it's the exact opposite of the hypothyroidism problem. And the symptoms of hyperthyroidism tend to reflect this faster metabolism and the speeding up of bodily processes. So we oftentimes see rapid weight loss or an increased appetite but no weight gain associated with it. Uh, insomnia is very common. Difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep can be very common in hyperthyroidism. Anxiety, sometimes erratic behavior, nervousness, irritability, uh, even panic attacks. In some cases, I've talked with uh, people who are hyperthyroid who were misdiagnosed initially as having panic disorder or panic attacks, and it turned out that it was actually underlying hyperthyroid episodes. Sometimes you'll find that it may be difficulty concentrating, or you may have a, a difficult, uh, difficulty with your attention span, a short attention span. Um, palpitations are common in hyperthyroidism, an irregular heartbeat, a high pulse, or a high blood pressure can be common. Uh, so sometimes people will report having a heart rate of 120, 130 when they're very hyperthyroid. Pal uh, the uh, atrial fibrillation, which is an erratic and uh, arrhythmia in the heart, is also a sign of hyperthyroidism in some people. Uh, some people who are hyperthyroid feel extremely sensitive to heat, uh, so they feel hot all the time, they're sweating all the time, they're excessively thirsty, they, they need to crank up the air conditioning, they cannot tolerate warm weather. Uh, hand tremors, sometimes people with hyperthyroidism will have a little bit of a shake in their hands or a little tremor. This is not uncommon, we've seen it in a lot of people with hyperthyroidism. Diarrhea or loose stools can be a common hyperthyroidism symptom as well. Uh, fatigue and exhaustion, even though that's a symptom that uh, I mentioned with hypothyroidism, it's also common in hyperthyroidism because if you think about the fact that your body is running at full speed and then some, it's actually running at hyperspeed, it can be extremely exhausting, especially if your hyperthyroidism is interfering with your ability to get good quality sleep. Some people with hyperthyroidism develop dry skin and they even develop unusual thickened patches of skin on the shins and the legs. These are uh, associated with Graves' disease and hyperthyroidism. Uh, people with hyperthyroidism can develop very fine, brittle hair. So again, the hair may be shedding and it may be brittle, but it oftentimes becomes very fine rather than coarse, which is what we see with the hypothyroidism. Infertility is also uh, common in hyperthyroidism as well. Uh, some women have lighter, less frequent, or even stop having menstrual periods when they're hyperthyroid. So that, again, menstrual irregularities, but typically towards the lighter, uh, less frequent, or even in some cases, absent menstrual periods. Uh, 
Uh, muscle weakness, especially in the upper arms and the legs. I've talked with so many thyroid patients who've described that just the act of lifting the hairbrush to brush their hair is completely exhausting, or their legs feel like lead weights when they're walking up and down the stairs. That can be a sign of hyperthyroidism. And then eye problems, which are often characteristic of Graves' disease, are sometimes seen in Graves and hyperthyroidism. And these can include double vision, scratchy eyes, sensitive eyes, sensitivity to light, and a bulging of the eyes, or the ability to see the whites of the eyes around the pupils. So that really goes through some of the key symptoms of hyperthyroidism. And again, it's not an all-inclusive list, but there are those really are the, the key ones that most people seem to uh, relate to the most. But there are a number of other symptoms as well. Let's talk about the next question, which is what is a goiter? And we've heard the term goiter, and sometimes people make fun of it, but a goiter is simply the medical term for an enlarged thyroid. So your thyroid gland can enlarge for a variety of reasons. It may enlarge because you are not getting in enough iodine or you're getting too much iodine, either through your diet or through supplements or through external sources. You can have thyroid inflammation or infection, so a thyroiditis type of uh, situation can cause inflammation and goiter in the thyroid, uh, or autoimmune disease. Goiter is associated with both Graves and Hashimoto's, the two autoimmune diseases that affect the thyroid. Uh, when there is a goiter, the thyroid becomes enlarged, and oftentimes it's large enough to be seen on an ultrasound or an x-ray, that enlargement level. And it may even be enlarged enough to visibly thicken your neck or to be visible. Symptoms of goiter can include a swollen, tender, or tight feeling in the neck or throat, and hoarseness or coughing, and sometimes people will even report difficulty swallowing or breathing if the thyroid is so enlarged that it's pressing on the trachea or the windpipe. Now, I mentioned earlier autoimmune thyroid disease, but let's talk about that as a key question. What is autoimmune thyroid disease? Autoimmune thyroid disease refers to diseases where the immune system is malfunctioning and develops antibodies that cause irregularities in your thyroid. There are two key autoimmune diseases, uh, Hashimoto's disease and Graves' disease. In the United States, the vast majority of thyroid conditions are the result of these two autoimmune diseases and Hashimoto's disease being the most common of all. Hashimoto's disease is also known as Hashimoto's thyroiditis and it's the most common thyroid problem in the U.S. and is also the cause of most hypothyroidism in the U.S. In Hashimoto's, antibodies that the body is developing are reacting against proteins in the thyroid and cause gradual destruction of the gland itself. Occasionally, before the thyroid is destroyed, before it completely becomes inactive, there are periods of overactivity, and this can be known as hashitoxicosis, uh, which can cause hyperthyroidism symptoms temporarily. Eventually, however, the thyroid usually will become destroyed or slowed down substantially and unable to produce enough thyroid hormone, causing permanent hypothyroidism. In addition to the symptoms of hypothyroidism that we talked about earlier, as the gland becomes inactive, some symptoms of Hashimoto's disease that you might experience would be pain and tenderness in the thyroid area, in the neck and the throat, and some people report difficulty sleeping. Graves' disease, sometimes referred to as diffuse, diffuse toxic goiter because of the typical presence of a goiter, is an autoimmune disease where antibodies bind to the thyroid gland and cause it to overproduce thyroid hormone. So it results in hyperthyroidism, an overactive thyroid. In addition to the symptoms of hyperthyroidism that we talked about before, the enlarged thyroid or the goiter is fairly common in Graves' disease. So let's talk about the key risk factors for thyroid disease. In the United States, it's estimated that anywhere from 30 to 60 million Americans have some form of thyroid dysfunction. Uh, that number is never decided on. You'll hear everything from 13 million to 27 million, and some studies have said that given the uh, shifting lab normal ranges for the TSH test, the number could be as high as 60 million. But we know that there are many millions of people in the United States with thyroid problems. And some of the key risk factors for developing thyroid disease include the following. First of all, gender. Women are as, much, as many as eight to 10 times more likely than men to develop thyroid conditions. But keep in mind, men are not immune. Men do develop thyroid problems and they get, they, uh, they get all the different thyroid conditions just like women, but at not a higher, as high a rate. 
Age is also an issue. Uh, thyroid pro problems become much more prevalent as we age, and some estimates say that by the time a woman is 60, uh, one in five will have a thyroid problem. So 20% of women will have a thyroid problem by age 60, and one in five men by the age of 70 will have a thyroid condition. Genetics and heredity and medical history are also key risk factors. There's a much greater risk of developing a thyroid condition if you have a parent, sibling, or child with any thyroid condition. That means autoimmune thyroid problems like Hashimoto's, Graves, nodules, goiters, thyroid cancer. A personal or family history of other autoimmune diseases, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, all of the various, there's a, a, almost 100 diseases that fall into the autoimmune category. If you have a family or personal history of any of those autoimmune diseases, then you are at a higher risk of a thyroid uh, condition, a high, an autoimmune thyroid condition. Um, first degree family members of anyone with autoimmune or thyroid are at increased risk of autoimmune thyroid conditions. So first degree family members, parents, uh, siblings, and children. Uh, genetic markers. There are some genetic markers that are considered to be uh, pointers to thyroid condition. And they're a little bit unusual, but they tend to travel on the same gene as the autoimmunity. So we see more people with left-handedness, ambidextrousness, and prematurely gray hair. Those tend to be markers for a higher risk for autoimmune disease, including the autoimmune thyroid issues. Cigarette smoking. Um, current or former smokers have an increased risk of thyroid disease. There are chemicals in cigarettes that are damaging to the thyroid gland, and so we see a higher risk of thyroid conditions in smokers, both current and former. Uh, a recent pregnancy or miscarriage. Uh, any woman who's ha recently had a baby or who's had a miscarriage uh, or a, an abortion, you're all at increased risk of developing thyroid problems. That's a period of risk for women uh, due to hormonal shifts. Um, iodine deficiency and excess. Both a deficiency of iodine and an excess of iodine are risk factors for thyroid disease. Overconsumption of goitrogenic foods. Uh, a particular class of foods known as goitrogens um, can promote thyroid enlargement. They promote a goiter and they can cause hypothyroidism when they're eaten in too many, uh, too large a quantity raw or when they are eaten just over consumed in general. Uh, these foods have the ability to block the body from using iodine in production of thyroid hormone. Uh, some common goitrogens include soy, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, millet, some berries. Basically a lot of the cruciferous vegetables fall into the goitrogenic category. Now again, if you cook them or steam them, these vegetables and foods are typically not going to have as much of an effect on the thyroid, but when overconsumed in large quantities, uh, we have a lot of people that are juicing now, uh, raw, raw vegetables, so you know, raw cabbage juice, etc. When you're drinking and eating large concentrated quantities of raw goitrogenic foods, that can have an impact on your thyroid. Toxic exposures are also a factor, a risk factor for thyroid issues. A variety of chemicals in the environment we now know have the ability to affect thyroid function, including uh, fluoride, chlorine, mercury, dioxins, perchlorate, uh, insecticides, BPA, uh, a variety of uh, pesticides that are used to fight West Nile virus. So there's a whole variety of things that are in our food, air, and water that can be risk factors for thyroid. And in particular, if you're in areas of high perchlorate concentration uh, or you've been exposed to certain pesticides, you may be at a higher risk. Nuclear exposure is one issue that we know is a factor for thyroid uh, issues. Uh, everyone has heard about the Chernobyl disaster and exposure to nuclear accidents certainly is a risk and including being downwind of those accidents. Uh, we had some concerns again last year during the Fukushima plant uh, meltdown as well. But uh, there's also issues with um, exposure to uh, uh, living or working in near nuclear plants and we have a lot of people who in, from the 40s to the 60s were in areas where there were nuclear test sites particularly in Nevada and there are higher rates of thyroid issues in some of those regions. Um, X-rays, radiation, and radium treatments are also a risk factor for thyroid disease. Uh, X-rays or radiation to the head, neck, and chest are risk factors for thyroid disease and some people who have had for example Hodgkin's disease and have had a lot of radiation treatments 
uh, people that were given nasal radium treatments back in the 40s and 50s for sinus infections or tonsil infections, uh, they are at higher risk. And there are even some studies that have shown that uh, multiple exposure to dental x-rays without use of a thyroid collar to shield the thyroid from the radiation may also be a risk factor as well. Uh, medical and drug treatments can be risk factors. There are drugs, as I mentioned earlier, lithium. Uh, there's a heart drug, uh, cordarone, that is uh, used for arrhythmias that also can cause hy uh, hypothyroidism and can increase the risk of, of various types of thyroid disease. Uh, one type of risk factor that's not as well known, but uh, we see it and we hear it and there's some studies on it, is neck trauma and whiplash. Uh, so when people have had a whiplash from a car accident or a broken neck, uh, in some cases neck surgery or vigorous manipulation of the neck and the thyroid area can be risk factors for thyroid disease. It seems that it may be causing some sort of inflammatory trigger and uh, setting people down the road towards having a thyroid condition. Uh, allergies and sensitivities uh, are risk factors and possibly triggers for thyroid problems. So we see seasonal pollen allergies, celiac disease, which is the inability to tolerate gluten, uh, gluten intolerance, and other food allergies seem to be risk factors. And then stress is also considered a precipitating factor for autoimmune diseases, including Graves and Hashimoto's. But in particular, the studies have focused on stress as a precipitator for Graves' disease. Uh, so we know that very stressful periods, physically or emotionally stressful periods, may be a risk factor for the development of Graves' disease. So that is, again, not an all-inclusive list of all of the risk factors, but certainly some of the key ones to keep in mind. So let's go on to the next question, which is how can you find out if you have a thyroid condition? Uh, so let's take a look at that. In addition to blood tests, which typically include the TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone test, uh, the free T4 or free thyroxine, free T3, free triiodothyronine, and thyroid antibodies tests, which can include the thyroid peroxidase antibodies or TPO, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins or TSI uh, and reverse T3 tests. Uh, the diagnosis of a thyroid problem really should always include a thorough clinical exam by a physician. Um, a typical clinical thyroid exam uh, which a lot of us don't get. That's one of the interesting things. Many people go to the doctor for their annual physical and they don't realize that the annual physical does not include thyroid testing. And many doctors never even put their hands on their on, on our neck to feel for an enlarged thyroid or do any evaluation. But a good thorough clinical exam of your thyroid should include a hands-on examination of the thyroid. So your doctor should feel for the thyroid enlargement or goiter looking for nodules and masses. So in some cases, if they're big enough or palpable, your doctor should be able to feel it and tell you that they're, they're detecting some sort of enlargement or mass. They also should use a stethoscope to examine your thyroid, and they're going to be listening for the sound of increased blood flow in the thyroid gland. Uh, they're going to want to check your reflexes, looking for either hyper-responsive reflexes or slow reflexes. Hyper-responsive typically points more towards hyperthyroidism, and slow reflexes point to hypothyroidism. A uh, heart and blood pressure check. Uh, very high or very low blood pressure can be thyroid symptoms, uh, as well as irregular heart rhythms, mitral valve prolapse. These can all be uh, signs that there may be an underlying thyroid issue, so you're going to want that to be part of the clinical exam. Typically, a good clinical exam will also include an examination of your hair and skin. Doctor's going to look for your for hair loss. They're going to look for that loss of the outer edge of the eyebrow hair. They're going to look to see whether you have a yellowish cast to your skin, if, you, if there's the presence of hives, lesions on the skin, uh, blister-like bumps on the forehead, separation of the underlying nail bed from the, from the uh, nail area, and swollen fingertips, which are all clinical signs that thyroid disease may be present. They also should do a thorough eye examination looking for signs of thyroid eye disease or thyroid related eye symptoms, which can include bulging or protrusion of your eyes, redness, inflammation, dryness, a stare in the eyes, retraction of the upper eyelids, a tremor in the eyes, puffiness, and other signs. Uh, in some cases, diagnosis of a thyroid condition also requires imaging tests. And those can include a nuclear scan or a radioactive iodine uptake test. This involves taking a small dose of iodine, radioactive iodine by mouth and then having an x-ray so that the actual function of the gland can be evaluated. 
In some cases, a CT scan or an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, may be done to take a look at the thyroid gland itself. And thyroid ultrasound is now becoming more uh, used by uh, practitioners to evaluate the size of the gland and to look for nodules and to try to characterize the types of nodules that you have. Suspicious thyroid nodules may also be evaluated by a biopsy procedure known as fine needle aspiration biopsy or FNA. So that's another type of test that is sometimes done to complete a, uh, a full thyroid evaluation. So let's talk about the next question. How is hypothyroidism diagnosed? How do we diagnose an underactive or slow functioning thyroid? Uh, to diagnose hypothyroidism, in addition to the history, symptoms, and clinical examination and discussion of risk factors, which we've gone over, uh, conventional doctors will use one blood test known as the TSH test. That's the thyroid stimulating hormone test. This test measures a pituitary hormone and is considered a marker for what's going on with the thyroid by the conventional medical world. A TSH test above the reference range is considered to be potentially hypothyroid and will be flagged as high on test results coming from a lab. Uh, remember, however, that there is a tremendous controversy going on right now in the thyroid world about this reference range. And some doctors consider a TSH above 2.5 to 3 to be evidence of hypothyroidism or mild subclinical hypothyroidism. Some integrative physicians consider the optimal range to be below 2 or even around 1. Uh, and but the the reference range the normal reference range tends to run from about 0.5 to 5 so we've got uh, one camp of endocrinologists on one side who believe that the range should be very broad that 0.5 to 5 we have other groups that believe it should be much narrower as low as 2 or 2.5 at the top end of the range and there are millions of people in the limbo between a TSH of 2.5 and 5 uh, who are really, deal depending on who they're dealing with, is what kind of answer they're going to get from their doctor, whether they have a thyroid condition or not. So uh, while doctors will tell you the TSH is the gold standard test, they don't even agree on what the test is actually telling them. And you can have a TSH of five. One doctor will tell you you're fine. Another doctor will tell you you're hypothyroid. So it's important to understand that that one test, while some doctors consider it standalone, is in the thinking of many thyroid, uh, many in the thyroid community, is not sufficient to really make a thorough diagnosis. Um, other blood tests that are typically done uh, by more thorough physicians or more open-minded physicians to diagnose hypothyroidism include the free T4, the free thyroxine test. Uh, this is giving us a picture of the stored thyroid hormone. T4 is the stored hormone. It needs to be converted into T3 in order to actually be used by the body. Uh, but a low normal level or a level below normal can be indicative of hypothyroidism in some people. And the free T3 or the free triiodothyronine, uh, a below normal level or a low normal level, and in some cases, some physicians believe levels below the midpoint of the reference range may uh, indicate uh, hypothyroidism because T3 is the actual circulating thyroid hormone that goes and delivers oxygen and energy to the cells. Um, so a reminder to folks, uh, if you're interested about these tests and you have doctors that are not willing to run those tests for you, uh, you can on our thyroidhub.com page click the green button at any time uh, to order your own tests uh, and they're going to be the same types of tests that your doctor would be ordering through LabCorp uh, but you'll be able to order them on your own and we have a very special price going on for the next week to celebrate World Thyroid Day. You can get a TSH test for only $25 in the US. You can get a full panel of uh, TSH, free T4, free T3, and uh, TPO thyroid peroxidase antibodies for $99 in the U.S. and $149 uh, worldwide. So it's a really great opportunity for people who may not have insurance or whose doctors or HMOs are acting as gatekeepers and preventing them from getting tests to be able to at least get to the point of getting some test results so that you can then make some informed decisions and move on to a doctor to get properly diagnosed and treated. So let's talk about Hashimoto's disease. How does Hashimoto's disease get diagnosed? 
Um, Hashimoto's disease or Hashimoto's thyroiditis is the autoimmune disease that uh, is a, the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the U.S., as we mentioned. Uh, to diagnose Hashimoto's, in addition to the history, family history, symptoms, and clinical examination, conventional doctors also are going to look for a high concentration of these uh, antithyroid peroxidase antibodies or TPO antibodies, or sometimes abbreviated as anti-TPO. Uh, some patients will have elevated uh, antibodies for months or even years before their TSH is reflective of the damage that's being done to the thyroid gland. Um, but there's a, a variety of research out there now in respected medical journals that shows that elevated antibodies, even when a patient is euthyroid, meaning their thyroid levels are normal within the reference range, uh, that they may still have a variety of thyroid symptoms. And there are some studies that have shown that treating people who have thyroid levels in the normal range but who have elevated TPO antibodies may actually help reduce those antibodies and prevent progression to overt hypothyroidism and in some cases even put a patient into a remission. Uh, some patients with Hashimoto's have high or high normal TSH or low or low normal free T4, free T3 as well. Occasionally, if someone is having a fine needle aspiration biopsy done on a nodule or goiter, uh, that may reveal evidence of Hashimoto's disease, but the fine needle aspiration biopsy is not typically done just to diagnose Hashimoto's disease. Usually the blood tests and the clinical exam uh, allow a doctor to make a diagnosis of Hashimoto's. Um, now let's talk about hyperthyroidism. How is hyperthyroidism diagnosed? To diagnose hyperthyroidism, in addition to a complete history, uh, symptom evaluation, risk factors, and a clinical examination by your physician, uh, conventional doctors are going to look for low thyroid stimulating hormone levels, low TSH levels, typically below 0.3 to 0.5, which is the bottom end of that normal reference range. Uh, the other blood test that they may do to look for evidence of elevated thyroid hormone is going to be that free T4 and free T3 test again. And they're going to be looking for high levels, either high normal or levels above the normal range for free T4 and free T3. As far as Graves' disease, the autoimmune disease, uh, how is that diagnosed? Let's take a look at that question. Uh, to diagnose Graves' disease, uh, in addition to the history, symptoms, clinical examination, uh, risk factors, conventional doctors are going to look for that uh, high TSH, so they're going to look for hyperthyroid TSH levels, so levels typically below 0.3 on the TSH, and in some cases some doctors consider really 0.1 as a bottom line cutoff, and high normal or high free T4 and free T3 levels. They also may look for evidence of thyroid stimulating antibodies, sometimes abbreviated as TSAB, or thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin, TSI. Uh, in some cases, to diagnose Graves' disease, a radioactive picture uh, is taken of the thyroid. So a, a small dose of radioactive iodine is given, an x-ray is taken, and they're able to see whether the thyroid is overproducing uh, hormone. And this overactivity of the gland is a hallmark of Graves' disease. Now, some people uh, notice that they have lumps or nodules, bumps in their thyroid, and the immediate concern is always, is if I have a lump, is it thyroid cancer? And most of us don't feel when we have a thyroid nodule or a lump. Thyroid nodules tend to be very small in most people. Um, occasionally, you may be able to feel it. Sometimes you can actually see it uh, by, by performing a thyroid neck check, which is a process of uh, drinking a glass of water in front of a mirror and looking at your neck. Uh, the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists have a, a good web page that instructs you on how to do a thyroid neck check. If you're interested, you can check that out. Um, but in most cases, nodules uh, aren't functioning. They're not doing anything. They don't cause symptoms, and they really require periodic monitoring by your physician. Usually an endocrinologist is going to monitor your nodules. Some nodules do have the ability, however, to impair the thyroid's function, and they will cause hypothyroidism, so they'll make the thyroid less able to produce uh, thyroid hormone. In some cases, nodules actually become active. They become like little thyroids on, unto themselves and produce thyroid hormone all on their own. These are called toxic nodules, and they can trigger hyperthyroidism. Uh, very large nodules um, can sometimes compromise breathing or swallowing. So when a nodule gets very large and it's pushing on uh, your windpipe, uh, you can find that it can affect your breathing, it can push on the trachea, it can affect your swallowing.
A very small percentage, uh, and some experts say somewhere around the 5% mark of thyroid nodules are cancerous. So while nodules should be checked out by a physician and usually an endocrinologist with expertise in thyroid nodule evaluation, it's unlikely that a thyroid nodule uh, or lump is going to turn out to be cancer. But that is not a reason not to check them out and not to have them evaluated by your physician. Uh, symptoms of nodules can depend on their size, function, and location. Uh, nod some nodules, again, are completely asymptomatic. They cause no symptoms. People won't even know they have them, uh, and they can live with them for years. They don't grow. They stay the same, and they don't cause any effects. In other cases, though, that when nodules um, are producing thyroid hormone, when they're toxic nodules, they can trigger hyperthyroidism symptoms, and people will may report palpitations, insomnia, weight loss, anxiety, tremors. Uh, nodules that are impairing thyroid function can trigger hypothyroid symptoms like weight gain, fatigue, depression, etc. Uh, larger no nodules that press on the windpipe, the esophagus, the vocal cords may cause difficulty swallowing, difficulty breathing, pain or pressure in the neck, a hoarse voice, or neck tenderness. And as I mentioned, some nodules cause absolutely no symptoms at all. Nodules that uh, can uh, are usually evaluated if they are deemed to be suspicious by a physician. And again, this is something that you want an endocrinologist to do. Your family doctor is probably not qualified to decide whether or not a nodule does, uh, needs further evaluation. Uh, so it's really a good idea when nodules are detected in some form or another to see an endocrinologist. Uh, some nodules will be evaluated with a fine needle aspiration biopsy. Uh, and if the nodule turns out to be benign uh, and doesn't cause any symptoms, typically the doctor will just monitor it uh, and uh, it may, they may give thyroid hormone, although there's a lot of controversy now about whether thyroid hormone actually will help uh, shrink nodules or prevent them from growing. Uh, in some cases, uh, there are treatments, percutaneous ethanol injections known as PEI, are injected into the nodule to help shrink it. Uh, and non-cancerous nodules that are impairing your breathing or swallowing uh, or speaking are usually surgically removed. And if a nodule does turn out to be cancerous uh, or when cancer can't be ruled out uh, com comprehensively or conclusively, the thyroid gland itself is usually removed. Um, a next question that I get very frequently is, is it safe to take thyroid medication when you're pregnant or breastfeeding? And over the last few decades, women have become very aware of the cautions against using prescription and non-prescription drugs during pregnancy or when breastfeeding. So we're hypersensitive uh, to making sure we're doing everything possible to keep our babies safe. And while these cautions are typically warranted for most drugs, uh, this warning does not apply to thyroid medications, uh, and in particular thyroid hormone replacement medications. Um, if you are hypothyroid and taking a thyroid hormone replacement medication like Synthroid, Levoxyl, Levothroid, Unithroid, Levothyroxine, uh, Eltroxin, Armor, uh, Naturethroid, Westthroid, Urfa. Uh, you want to be on your thyroid hormone medication when you get pregnant. You want to stay on your thyroid hormone medication and re taking it away could actually harm or endanger your pregnancy. So you want to make sure that you're taking your medication and actually planning in advance with your doctor is really important because if you uh, do get pregnant while you're hypothyroid, typically about 50% of the women, no, I'm sorry, actually I think 80% of the women need as much as a 50% increase in their dosage. So let's talk about what the TSH test measures, going back to that TSH test. And again, a reminder that as part of our World Thyroid Day uh, commemoration, my med lab is uh, making that TSH test available uh, at 2,000 locations around the U.S. for $25. Uh, and as there's also a full panel of tests that includes the TSH that's available as well. So back on thyroidhub.com, you can click on the green button and get the information about that. But let's talk about what that TSH test actually measures because it's considered the gold standard by the endocrinology community. It may not be by the patient community, but uh, many people will find that this is the only test that they're going to be able to get through their, their uh, traditional physicians, HMOs, etc. 
So the thyroid stimulating hormone test is a blood test that's measuring the amount of this TSH, which is a pituitary hormone in your bloodstream. Uh, the test is sometimes called the thyrotropin stimulating hormone test as well. You may hear that. When the pituitary detects that there is not enough circulating thyroid hormone, TSH hormone is released. So TSH is considered a mes messenger hormone that, set, that says to the thyroid gland, essentially, make more hormone, produce more. So the pituitary releases more TSH, and the TSH level rises uh, when you don't have enough thyroid hormones. A higher TSH indicates a low thyroid hormone production or hypothyroidism. Uh, conversely, hyperthyroidism, when there's too much thyroid hormone circulating, causes that TSH to drop. So the pituitary detects that there's enough thyroid hormone circulating, it drops the TSH level. Uh, and that oftentimes, again, is indicative of hyperthyroidism. The TSH level typically remains in what's called the normal reference range when the thyroid gland is healthy and functioning normally. Again, values in the, uh, in the lower end or below normal of TSH may indicate hyperthyroidism. In severe hyperthyroidism, the TSH level may even be undetectable or zero. Non-existent or nearly undetectable TSH levels are also referred to as suppressed levels. The lower the TSH, the more suppressed the thyroid is considered to be and the more hyperthyroid you may be, although thyroid cancer patients are often maintained at these suppressed levels on thyroid hormone replacement drugs as a way to prevent cancer recurrence. Uh, so that's a separate issue there. Uh, values in the upper end of normal on TSH uh, or above the top of the normal range are conventionally considered to be more indicative of hypothyroidism or the underactive thyroid. And the higher the number, the more hypothyroid or underactive the thyroid is considered to be. Now, LabCorp's reference range for TSH is typically around 0.45 to 4.5. But since 2002, the National Academy of Clinical Biochemistry, NACB, recommended that that reference range be between 0.4 and 2.5, uh, with the TSH being between 0.5 and 2.0 as the therapeutic target for hypothyroidism treatment. So this is uh, information that you're not always going to get from your doctor because the lab report is going to reflect the, the reference range that is still in place for the last 10 years, despite the fact that there's disagreement now about what that reference range should be. Uh, the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, AACE, has actually said that they encourage doctors to consider treatment for patients who test outside the boundaries of the narrower margin. So if people are between 0.3 and 3.0, AACE says they're normal, but if they're outside that range, they consider that to be uh, a marker for possible testing. Uh, so there's a lot of disagreement about this uh, among the endocrinologists, among conventional doctors, among integrative and functional medicine, hormone experts, et cetera. We've got a lot of different opinions about this, but you need to realize that Simply being told your thyroid is normal is not enough information. You need to know those actual numbers and you need to know what criteria your doctor is using to decide what's normal and what's not. Let's talk about free T4 and free T3 and what do they measure. Uh, T4 and T3 are the actual circulating thyroid hormones in the bloodstream. The 3 and the 4 actually refer to the number of iodine molecules attached to each hormone. So normally the thyroid is able to produce this hormone by absorbing iodine. So we get iodine, which is an essential nutrient from our food, iodized salt, supplements, and that iodine is then combined with the amino acid tyrosine to produce T4 and T3. Uh, of the thyroid hormone produced by a healthy thyroid gland, about 80% is T4, 20% T3. It depends on which book you look at. There's a variety of different ratios. Um, T3 is considered the a biologically active hormone that's used by the cells and is several times stronger than the T4. So the body converts the inactive or storage T4 to active T3 by removing one of those iodine molecules. Uh, this is a process that's known as T4 to T3 conversion or monodeiodination, which is the uh, technical term. This conversion of T4 to T3 can take place in the thyroid or other organs, including the hypothalamus, which is part of your brain. Some doctors believe that in addition to or even apart from the TSH, it's crucial to also evaluate the actual level of circulating thyroid hormones. 
um, in the bloodstream, the, the thyroid hormones T4 and T3 are floating around in two different forms, both free and uh, unbound, free unbound, and then bound hormones. The free or unbound T4 and T3 refer to the part of the hormone that's actually biologically active, and therefore, um, un, uh, but the, uh, okay, biologically active, and therefore. Um, the bound part is attached to a protein and is not available to your cells. Uh, so the free or unbound T4 uh, and T3 are the levels that give us the most accurate picture. So sorry I, I fumbled that a bit. But uh, so free and unbound free T4 and free T3 are measuring the actual amounts that are available in the bloodstream. The bound levels or the total T4, total T3 are measuring all of it and some of it is not necessarily going to be available to the cells. Uh, reverse T3, controversial topic. Um, why is reverse T3 measured by some doctors and certainly not all. There are some doctors that are opposed to using reverse T3 measurements and feel that it's not relevant. Others include it as a very important part of their treatment protocol. When the body's under stress, this process of converting T4 to T3, the active form of thyroid hormone, um, can get uh, mal mal can, can see malfunctions. So the body will, in some cases, in when it's in stress, conserve energy by converting T4 into an inactive form of T3 known as reverse T3. Uh, some practitioners believe that even when the stress is relieved, this process continues. So the T4 to T3 conversion continues to go into the reverse T3, which can then create a problem at the cellular level because the, C, the T3, the active hormone that's circulating in the body, is made up of a substantial percentage of this inactive form of T3, which can leave us hypothyroid uh, at the cellular level. Uh, so this value of reverse T3 tests are controversial, but this test has become much more popular with open-minded and integrative functional medicine physicians who are looking to access the full range of thyroid function. Uh, the thyroid peroxidase antibody test, let's take a look at that test. The thyroid peroxidase antibody test, also sometimes known as antithyroid peroxidase or abbreviated as TPOAB or anti-TPO, is done as a first step in diagnosing autoimmune thyroid disease in many cases. Thyroid peroxidase antibodies actually attack your thyroid gland and an enzyme that plays a part in the conversion of T4 to T3. So the presence of TPO antibodies can mean that the thyroid tissue is being destroyed, such as in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, in some cases, we also see it in postpartum thyroiditis. And uh, in some cases, Graves' disease patients also test positive for these TPO antibodies. And I think, actually, that, that, that we have come to the end of all of the questions. Uh, I was moving along pretty fast. So we're within the one hour time frame here. And again, uh, I would like to uh, remind folks that if you're interested in sharing questions, please go to thyroidhub.com and search on questions. You'll find answers uh, to some existing questions. If you have additional questions that I didn't cover in today's top 20 questions, I will uh, be happy to cover them in upcoming live stream broadcasts that, that we'll be having uh, down the road. And stay tuned at thyroidhub.com and my uh, Facebook support community at facebook.com slash thyroid support for more information about upcoming live stream events like this. And again, if you're interested in getting any of these tests that we were talking about and having uh, access to them at very good prices that are being offered this week to commemorate World Thyroid Day to help make it affordable for people to get these tests, even uh, if you don't have insurance or your doctors or HMOs won't, uh, won't order these tests for you, uh, click on the green button at thyroidhub.com and you're going to be able to get uh, access to the TSH test. Uh, again, for $25 or the full panel TSH, free T4, free T3, and TPO thyroid peroxidase antibodies for $99 in the U.S. and $149 worldwide. And this is really an important first step for many of us because once you have some information, then you can turn around and find the doctors and the practitioners who are really going to be able to help you get 
in tune with this, get the proper diagnosis, get the proper treatment. And, you know, we're, we're facing a lot of challenges. We have HMOs that are denying uh, almost every possible course of action beyond the most basic tests. We have insurance companies that won't cover anything except a TSH test. We have people that are out of work and are, have lost their health insurance and can't afford to go in and pay out of pocket at a lab hundreds and hundreds of dollars for these same panels of tests that you would have to pay if you were paying the retail prices. Um, so this is an, a really incredible opportunity for people to get that uh, those tests that they may need and to create a, a an online health record, a secure and private online health record, which will help you keep track of things in the future, and also to access various expert reviews for various conditions. And so I would encourage you to explore a little bit more about my med lab as well. And again, send in those questions. We'll have another live stream broadcast again soon, and I'll see you on the internet. Uh, this is Mary Showman, and happy World Thyroid Day. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a great uh, opportunity to speak with all of you and I wish you all the best of health. Thank you.